All right, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to Kabbalah and Coffee. Today is Sunday, August 15, 2021, and it is great to have you all here in person, online, and everywhere and anywhere in between. We also, I should also uh, make a mention of all of the folks that listen and watch after the class, because we have a very robust um, podcast community as well as YouTube community. So for all of you listening, not live, Shout out to, to you all. All right, let's jump in. I want to speak about the concept of light. We started this topic last week, the idea of light. And I feel like it's a very interesting, very, very important Kabbalistic concept that could be very under, misunderstood. So I feel like we need to really jump in and explore it kind of from A to Z. So let's talk about the meaning of light. What do we mean when we refer to spiritual light? So I'm going to clarify. In trying to capture in language that which moves, I'm using the word moves with like air quotes, that which moves from beneficiary to, sorry, from benefactor to beneficiary, basically something that's, that moves from giver to receiver, so in trying to describe that, um, there, there are different terminologies that can be used, especially when we speak about God, right? So you think about God. God is giving us so many different things, including life, the ability to, to um, uh, first of all, granting creation existence, granting us specifically life, giving us all of the soul powers that we have. So how do we refer to that which God gives to us. So there was a, a bit of a, of a language disagreement or just different terminology that was used by the Jewish philosophers and by the Jewish mystics. The Jewish philosophers preferred the word shefa. You know what shefa means? Shefa means flow. Shefa is flow. The Kabbalists, those were the philosophers, the Jewish philosophers. The Kabbalists preferred the term ar, which means light. So shefa or are. Let's talk about the difference between these two, these two um, terms, either a flow or light. Again, all to, to somehow put a, put a definition, put a word on the idea, on, on that which God gives to us. What is that? So to, to capture it in language. So let's talk about flow for a moment. Flow would be, I'm looking around at, at our water source over here in this room. So Flow would be like water, like a liquid, where you pour the liquid from one, let's say one cup or one entity to the other. So it's flowing from one place to the other. Or without pouring a cup, you could refer to, you could think of this in the context of a river, which has a source, right? And then flows downstream from one place to the other. I recently saw a picture, one of these kids' magazines that had like different cool pictures of nature. What's that um, wild waterfall in Africa called? Is it Victoria Falls? Is that the one? Yeah. Yeah, there's Victoria Falls? Okay. So apparently in Victoria Falls, there's a place where you can swim like right before the water, right? Yeah, and Anne's making like, oh my gosh, exactly. That's exactly my take on that. Like, you gotta be kidding me. But you could swim theoretically, like right before the falls, there's like an area that's relatively calm, we call it the come before the falls, I guess. Um, anyway, so the water, but, but the water of the falls, the water flows, right? Shefa, it flows from source in the context of the waterfall and flows downward, very far downward, very forcefully downward into the collection as the water collects beneath the falls. Okay, so that's Shefa. Shefa is, is kind of usually hallmarked by a liquid. A flow is typically like a liquid, a liquid that flows. And this, this could be used in reference to God, to God, to what God gives to us. It's a flow of energy, a flow of life, a flow of blessings. This is, this is a ter terminology that we could use, that God is giving, we're receiving, what's God giving? A shefa, hashpa'a, flow or influence. Okay, so that's one one description. And that's a description that the philosophers preferred. 
And then you have the mystics, the Kabbalists. The Kabbalists preferred a different description, a different adjective. I don't know if it's an adjective, but a different um, construct. And that construct is R, which means light. The Kabbalists preferred to refer to what God gives to us as light, not physical light. Yes, there's also a sun, right, that God created that gives us light. But anything, any sort of um, blessing, any sort of gift, any anything that moves, so to speak, from God to us, the Kabbalists refer to as our light. Why light? So the mystics explained the significance of that phrase, our, which means light. Because light has certain properties and characteristics that are very unique, that really don't exist anywhere else in creation. And that really speak to um, the way God interacts with us and the way we are enlivened by God. So here we go. The first thing we know about light, R, is that it, I'm, I'm going to use the Hebrew term, terminology or the mystical language, that R is me'en ha-ma'ar. Light is similar to the ma'ar. R is light. Ma'ar is the source of light. Light is always similar to the source of light. What does that mean? That means that as the source of light is, so is the light. If the source of light looks one way, the light is, is automatically going to look the same way. The light is never different than the source of light. Unless something is getting in between and modifying it. But otherwise, without a modification, the light is always, the R is always me'en hamar. The light is always similar to the source of light. So for example, for example, if you're at a movie theater and there's a projector that's projecting the light, that's projecting the, the image onto the screen from behind the theater, from the back of the theater, right? The light, there's a projector, a strong projector, projecting the light all the way to the front of the theater onto the big screen. Whatever is in the source, whatever that source light looks like, right? With the images that are moving, right? Whatever that source light looks like, that is what the light that is projected at the destination, that's what that light looks like. R is me'en hamar, light. The, the, the end of the light always looks like the beginning of the light. Unless, again, as I said before, the one exception, if something modifies it in between, and then you know all, all bets are off. But without the modification, I was assuming there's no modification done to the light. What I mean by modification is you, know, you can have a, a pure light, and then you put a filter. You put a color filter in front of it, and now suddenly it's red light, or it's green light, or it's uh, blue light. So th the color can change. So you wouldn't say that, oh, the light that you have here at the end, this blue light is what's in the original. It's not the original. It's just the way it's filtered through the, uh, through the filter. And I know I actually gave the example for the projection, which you could say is a filter also, and thus what's coming out is, a, is filtered light, but either way, I don't want to get so, so, so bogged down into that point. The main idea here is that the R is always made in Amar. The light always looks like the source. The second point that we know about light is that light cannot exist without being constantly connected to the source. The moment you put a full screen, a full, or let's say we had a flashlight and I hold a book in front of the flashlight, the moment we stop, the flow of light from the source, the moment we interrupt the, um, the, the source of light, the, the emanation of light ceases to be as well. Or using another example, if I turn off the flashlight, all of the light disappears. And there's no light that remains, you know, the flashlight could be on for, for 10 minutes. The moment I shut off the flashlight, and I'm camping out in the woods, right? And I have a flashlight. I've been whole, I've, I've, I've kept the flashlight or the lantern on. Then I turn it off, immediately goes dark. And it's not like some light particles remain because they float out from the source. So they kind of remain floating around and illuminating. No, the moment I cut the light, the light disappears. Why? Because light doesn't exist outside the source. The moment I end the source is the moment that the light itself, that the light also ends. So we have the idea that R is me'en hamar, the light is always like the source. And the idea that the light cannot exist 
independent of the source. And both are connected, both ideas are connected. And the common denominator between these two ideas is that light is nothing other than the source of light shining. Light doesn't have its own entity, its own existence. All it is, is source shining. The difference between R and Shafa, between light and flow is like this. If I take water and I pour the water into another cup. I can take the first cup and I can crush it. I can burn it. I can throw it away. I can do whatever I want with it. The water is still, has still been poured, right? Or another example, I can have a well of water and I can dole out, I can, I can fill up a bucket from that well and take it to my house and use that water. And I have not, and, and the moment I move it away from that source, the water in my well doesn't disappear. If that well dries up, I still have water. As the well goes, my water does not go, right? Now, I may, if the well dries up, I won't be able to get more water tomorrow. But if I've already drawn the water, the water exists even if the well water itself is completely dry. Why? Because when it comes to shafo, when it comes to the flow, to flow of, let's say, liquid, so it's not constantly dependent on, it's not constantly tethered to the source. Which means it doesn't act exactly like the source, number one. And number two, it can exist independent of source because it's not, it doesn't require constant connection. Light is unique in that its only existence is insofar as the source is shining. As long as we have lights in this room, right? So as long as the light, as long as the source of light is active, the light shines. The moment we turn off the light at the source, there's no more light. So the source of light and the light that comes out of the source are really one and the same. You don't have two entities that exist. It's, it's, one, it's one reality. The R and the Ma'ar, again, the Hebrew is R is light, Mar is source of light. R and Ma'ar are really one and the same. If you shut off the mar, if you shut off the source of light, the R also shuts, shuts off, shuts down. The R, the light, looks like the mar, is similar to the light, to the source of light. Whereas when it comes to Shefa, once you've poured the water, so to speak, once you've transferred the water, so the source can do whatever it wants, and that's fine. By the way, this is how the mystics explain the fallacy of the philosophers who believed there were some philosophers, not necessarily Jewish philosophers, but some philosophers who believed that God created the world and is no longer involved in the goings on of the world. God created the world, wiped his hands with it and said, all right, the world exists, carry on, do your thing. And as the Alter Rebbe, the, the founder of Chabad, explains, or the way he describes it is, these philosophers believe that God is like an artist who creates a work of art and then walks away. Like in this room, we have art, right? So at some point in time, I don't know when, an artist created, just to show you guys what I'm talking about, right? We have works of art on the walls. Yeah, okay. So at some point in time, an artist went ahead and created these paintings. And then at a certain point in time, the artist finished a painting and took the canvas and somehow it got to this room, right? The artist does not need to be constantly draw painting in order for the painting to exist. It's done and it exists because the painting exists separate from the artist. So the paint would be more, hey, good morning. The paint would be likened to shefa, to flow. Paint is also somewhat liquid, right? Or it's liquid-ish. You, you take paint from a source, you apply it to a canvas, you've moved it from one place to the other. It exists in its new location, separate from its original location, right? Originally, I'm just picturing one of those cool palette things. You know those palettes? Yeah, you have those palettes with the thing, with all the, with all the paint and you dab inside and you're painting. You've moved the paint from your palette to the canvas 
and it's moved. You don't need to, you don't need to, you don't need to constantly reapply the paint. The paint exists. So all of this beautiful art in this room was created, and then the artist walked away or moved the art away. In fact, and this is not, obviously we we wish uh, a very long and, and happy life to, to all the artists in, in this room. But the artist and artist theoretically could no longer be alive and their art still exists. You don't need the, the artist to power the art constantly. Does that make sense? So the Alter Rebbe says that the original, the great philosophers, some of the great philosophers, again, not necessarily the Jewish philosophers, but some great philosophers believe that God is like an artist or like a sculptor who created the world, fashioned existence, and then said, I'm out, right? This is good. This is done. Disconnected. And this is where the idea of light, of, of R, comes in play. Because as the mystics tell us, creation is not, or God's, what God gives is not in the form of shefa, flow, but rather R, which is light. And the nature of light is that light cannot exist at any moment without the source of light shining. So unlike the art in this room that can exist separate from physically on every level can exist separate from the artist, the universe cannot exist separate from God. Why? Because all of this, everything that we see, everything that we have is light. This is all light. In modern terminology, you might say that, that this existence, our lives, our reality, is like a divine hologram. What's a hologram? A hologram is a projection of light that creates the appearance of something that exists. But in truth, all that exists is the light. And what is the light? The light is really an emanation from the source of light that is projecting that hologram into being. I've used this example many times. Who was the first one? Was it Tupac? Yeah. Who had a holographic concert years ago, a few years ago? Yeah. Since then, they've had many individuals that have, uh, with technology that, that have been, who did I see recently that had that done? It was weird because I think they were singing with their own hologram. You guess what I'm talking about? Yes? If somebody singing with their own hologram, it was kind of like, whoa, that's trippy. But anyway, it could look to totally real. Like, given the right light conditions, obviously, right, it has to be, it has to be relatively dark, and obviously the, the, the technology has to be, you know, top of the line, good to go. But you get the sound, you get the, you get the video, you get the hologram, I mean, going. And it could look real but all it is is a projection. So this is where the Kabbalistic, let me say the word analogy, but it's more than analogy. This is where the Kabbalistic phraseology of R, of light is so important. Because what it means is that this entire reality is born of God's light. And what that means is that this doesn't really exist outside source because light doesn't exist outside, R doesn't exist outside of Mar. Light and source of light are not two separate entities. Paint, okay, palette and canvas are two separate realities. The paint was here. Now it's there. It's done. You had paint on the palette. You applied it. You Bob Rossed it over to a, to a canvas. And that's it. It's moved. You have some paint there, some paint there. It exists outside of, of the original source. It doesn't need the original source to constantly enliven it to, in order to exist. It could be separate. When it comes to light, though, none of that applies. When it comes to light, light doesn't exist without the source of light shining. And what the light looks like is what the source of light looks like. It's not like it's going to change anyway. It's the What is projected is what's projected. That's all you have. And the moment you stop the projection, whatever is being projected, ceases to exist.
What Adam is saying is this this speaks to the idea of continuous creation. Exactly. Exactly. It should be right, 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 right. Good. So Adam is pointing out that there is a bit of a mis misunderstanding when we speak about the concept of creation. You know, you read the Bible and it says God created the world in six days, rested on the seventh, and it seems like it's done. That's not the truth. Certainly not according to Judaism and Kabbalah. The truth is that creation is a constant ongoing process, which blends into the term evolution. Right, it's kind of like there's creation, there's an origin. It starts somewhere, but it's continuously evolving, continuously being created, continuously being reimagined and reprojected into existence. Which is one of the reasons why we believe that nothing is impossible, nothing is truly impossible. Personal change is always possible because at every moment we're being recreated. This is some. This is one of the powerful kind of trippy, mystical ideas that emerges from that idea, right? That if, in fact, we are constantly being projected into existence, that means that my projection in this moment is not a relic of the past. You see, the art on this wall, the art on the, on the walls over here in this room, that art didn't change from yesterday. How do I know this? I was here yesterday, and it looked the same, right? So literally, the art doesn't change. The art remains... It looks the same because it's it's shefa. It's been moved. The paint has been applied. That's it. But that which is constantly being recreated, constantly being projected, has the ability to be fresh. has has this newness to it, and uh, and and this vitality, this vibrancy. So life is dynamic. It's not static. And one of the big ideas in the last uh, number of years is the notion of you, uh, ideal, ideally, you and I, we have, we should have a growth mindset. You could have, there's a static mindset, and then there's a growth mindset. Carol Dweck wrote a book <laughs> called Mindset that speaks about growth mindset. What is a growth mindset as opposed to the other, to a more static mindset? So one approach is, I am who I am. I know what I know, right? It is what it is, not changing. That's not a growth mindset. A growth mindset is, Constantly open to learning, discovering, reinventing oneself, and changing the world. Right? That's a growth mindset. That's a dynamic mindset. And I'll tell you the truth: that the premise of her book is very Kabbalistic. The premise of this idea of of a growth mindset is very mystical, because the whole concept of that we can change, we can grow, we we can be open to learning, and and life is dynamic, is an outgrowth of of the Kabbalistic idea that life itself is an ongoing process. Life is an ongoing movement of life. It's not something that happened. It's something that is happening. Creation is not something that happened once upon a time. It's something that is constantly happening and rehappening. It's not a word. Regenerating, <laughs> reoccurring. That's a better word. Reoccurring at every moment. All of this comes from the language, or light, or all this is captured in the, in the terminology that the mystics use for the energy of creation, which is our light as opposed to Shefa. So I started off the class by saying that the philosophers, Jewish philosophers, they preferred or they used the term Shefa when referencing what God grants or what God bestows. God gives a flow of energy and vitality, Shefa. The Kabbalists prefer the appellation, prefer the, uh, the, the term R, light. Two completely different ideas. They seem innocent, it seems very innocent, like flow, light, it's the same thing, right? God is giving either a flow of energy or God is giving a ray of light. Is there, is there such a difference? There's a major difference, right? Language matters. Flow means that something moved from one place to the other. It's detached from the source. It can exist on its own. It doesn't need the source anymore. That's what flow is, right? I have a, a cup of tea over here. I took it from originally from the hot water 
thing, earn, right? I toggled the toggle, not toggle, the, um, the nozzle, whatever, whatever it's called, the, the uh, exact mechanics of the, of the earner escaping me. But anyway, we, I opened it up. The water goes into the cup, put a tea bag inside, put a little honey in there. Boom, I got it. You know what? That has been depleted. The water now is in here. They're separate, different realities. That's it. Doesn't look like it looked before. Completely different. Light does not operate like that. The moment the light is disconnected from the source, it doesn't exist. And the reason why I'm telling you all of this is so that we have a solid kind of background in understanding the terminology light. When we talk about light in Kabbalah, we are not talking about the sun. We're not talking about physical light. What we're talking about is very specifically the, the, the divine influence, the divine beneficence, the divine influence that creates and sustains us and everything around us. And the way it works is in a manner of light, that what God gives is like the source. And what God gives is connected to the source. So what God gives is really the source. So all of the light, all of the existence that we have is really Ma'in Hamar, similar to the source. One of the it's one of the explanations of what it means that we're creating the divine image, right? Because if everything is light, then everything is like light is like the source, so everything is like the source. So let's understand that in the source there are two realities. two dimensions within the divine source. There's something that we would call, so let's, let's before we get into some, into more mystical terminology, first of all, let me check in. Does this make sense? What we just explained about light? Yes. I'm checking in on you guys online. Yes. All right. Perfect. Make sense. Okay. There are two dimensions to God. And I hate saying that. And I've been debating all morning whether I should say that or not, but I just said it because it sounds like I'm dividing God into two, which is super awkward from a monotheistic perspective, right? It's like, well, turns out there's actually, no. So, but there's two aspects. The terminology is hard to express correctly and, and without blasphemy, but there's two elements, if you will, when it comes to God that we can speak about. Number one is God as God relates to creation. And number two is God as God stands beyond creation. So, let me, let me contextualize this perhaps in a bit of, uh, I'm going to use the word historical context, but you'll see what I mean in a second. So, you know, creation didn't always exist. When I say creation, this didn't always exist. According to the Torah, according to our belief, according to our faith, this came about at a certain time. When? In the beginning. When was that? All right, we have a number on that, but you know, numbers are, are not relevant right now. But there's a beginning. There's a, start, there's a starting point to this. And of course, the question is, so where does this come from? It comes from God. Who is God? Well, we don't know who God is, but what's God? And, and, and when was God? God was always. In Judaism, God, one of the things that we can say about God without defining God, because how can we define God? Um, Reminds me of, the, of a course on Kabbalah that we once, once did, a JLI course called, was it called the Kabbalah of Why? No, it was called, it was called the Kabbalah of Why? We did it in this room. I don't know. Whatever. I don't remember the course title, but I just remember it got like super, super trippy. We talked about time and reality and God. One of the tricky things about speaking about God is that we don't want to define God because the moment you define God is the moment you're probably not talking about God because if you can define God, it's probably not God. But you still have to speak. You don't have to, but we still want to speak about God in some sort of intelligible way. So we struggle, but, but we do our best. So here's one way to, to speak about God. God exists before creation exists. God always exists, which means God exists outside the limitations of time and space outside the limitations of creation. The example that I gave a number of weeks ago, which I really love, is the soccer example, right? Whoever created the game called soccer decided that the rules are you can't use your hands. 
I was speaking to my kids about this yesterday, sharing this analogy. And then one of my kids says, but the goalie, what about the goalie? And I said, the goalie is divine, must be. The goalie transcends the rule. Even in the rules, the goalie transcends the rules. This is like a miracle that's manifest within the confines of nature, something supernatural that breaks. All right, fine. So that's the goalie. It's the Kabbalah of, of goalies. Back to, back to the, the analogy, though, before we get to the exception to the rule. The, the reality, the, the, the analogy is that at some point in time, somebody decided or people, just, does anybody know the origins of soccer? Like who made it up? But, but so who, like, where was this created? England. Interesting. Okay. Maybe they were drinking tea with their hands. So they're like, we can't use hands. We need to use feet. All right. That was a joke. Okay. You can use your head. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Use your head. Don't use your head, right? It's one of those things. Although, probably doesn't hurt. I don't know. Not a big soccer player. Back to our story. In Pittsburgh, I grew up playing baseball and football and hockey. It's probably no surprise that the three professional sports in Pittsburgh are baseball, football, and hockey. We didn't have a basketball team. We didn't have a soccer team. I don't think we had a soccer team back in the day, and that was it. Okay, back to the story. So somebody decided at a certain point in time, you know what, let's create a sport. They had different accents, obviously. Let's create a sport. I'm not going to try it. In which we're in, you can't use your hands. You can use your feet. Okay, done. So they created the rules. Now, did people exist before the game of soccer? Sure. Did hands exist? Sure. Did people use their hands? Absolutely. Before and after also. So in other words, you create a certain game, you create a certain reality, but the creators exist outside that reality. They're not like only in that reality. They exist outside that reality as well. In a very similar way, you know, we, we talk sometimes about games, like video games, where video game creators create all these elaborate worlds and dimensions, right? this reality, this complete, who was, we were speaking about the metaverse recently. Ed, was that with, was I speaking with you about the metaverse? Huh. Maybe this conversation happened in the metaverse. Oof, that would be next level. But this metaverse is like where you can exist in like this virtual avatar reality and just, you know, theoretically hook oneself up like matrix style to another reality and just have experiences in this virtual space, which then begs the question, is it really any different than this experience? What makes one more real than the other? If it's the perception and the sensation is it not the same, theoretically? If that could replicate the experiences that we have here, so then is it fundamentally any different? And really the question that I'm trying to ask without asking it is, is this not that? Right, you're with me on that. Is this not that? Is this not a metaverse that we just <laughs> haven't realized that it's a metaverse? How real is this? Okay. Now that we're all like super like tripped out and confused and, and questioning the very fabric of reality. So let's jump back in. The point is that whoever creates the game exists outside the game. They created the game, created the rules, created the worlds, but they're not stuck inside that space. They're not confined to those limitations. They're outside also. I believe in the matrix. It's been a number of years. I believe in the matrix. It was a Keanu Reeves. He's the, he's Neo. Did I get this right? Neo, which according to my research back in the day, Neo, if you rearrange the letters of Neo one, so Neo was like the one he's the guy who discovers that everybody's hooked up to machines. Am I right here? Yes. I'm just checking it on the plot to make sure I don't. Oh, by the way, spoiler alert, Woo, like flash of science. If you haven't watched it or whatever, planning on watching it, you may want to fast forward or whatever, or not, because it's a really old movie um, at this point. So everybody is hooked up. And then there's like the awareness of, oh, there's a reality outside of this being hooked up to that reality. 
so there's two dimensions. There's two aspects of God. Again, I don't want to divide God into two, but there's two dimensions, two aspects. There's God as creator and God beyond creation. There's God in the modality of, oh, I'm going to create this thing. I'm going to invest in this, in this reality, in this world. And then there's God, just God, beyond all of this. And each of these aspects of God emanates light. This is the big idea. Both aspects of God are emanating light. The aspect of God that is invested in creation in a very deliberate fashion, like let's create this. Let's figure out how we to make this work. God doesn't have to figure it out, but let's make this work. So that aspect of God emanates light or shines, emanates is fine also, shines or emanates light that is very much attuned to the box that's being created, very limited to the space within which it is filling, the limited space that it's filling. We call that our memale, the light that fills existence, because it's meant to be contained within the confines of existence. So for example, you want to build a game, you want to code a game, you want to create a video game a reality. So you think about what it looks like, and then you have to step down into that space and create the framework and create everything and literally code it into existence within that box, within that design. And then you have God beyond creation, the way God is essential. And God on that level also shines. That's also an emanation of light. But this is not a limited, confined, right, in the box light. This is a powerful, essential. When I say the word essential, I mean God's essence beyond a particular modality of, well, let me create this world with these limitations today, um, reality. This is the essential divine or quintessential divine reality that transcends the particularism of this reality that we call creation. And that also, from that space, from that aspect of God, there's also light that shines. Light is also shining there. Right. So the question is, does that essential light also have a filter? The language that the, the and, and you'll be familiar, everybody I think will be familiar with this um, phrase. The Kabbalists refer to this as the Ar Ein Sof, the infinite light. So I guess you could say the fact that we call it light is already some sort of filter. Because if it's truly infinite and whatever, then you can't even call it light. So the fact that it's source, that shining, means that on some level, it is stepping into manifestation mode. So even if it's not stepped down and boxed and, and tailored to the specific limitations of this reality, it's still somewhat in a revelatory state of being. It's not just withdrawn to self, it's it's out there. So on some level, it's it's moved from within to without. Like the source of light is now sharing that light on some level. So you could say on some level there is some somewhat of a filter or step down, but as much as possible it is still true to the original infinite essence, which is why we call it the R ain't so the infinite light. Notice by the way, we don't call it well Okay, there's really two expressions in Kabbalah. One expression is Ein Sof, which is a reference to God. God is the Ein Sof, the infinite. And then there's the Ar Ein Sof, which is the infinite light, two different realities. There's God as infinite, and then there's God's infinite light. So one is the source, and one is the light. But as I told you before, the whole premise of this class is that light is always similar to the source of light. So if the source is infinite, then the light is infinite. But if the source is finite, and no, I'm not saying that God is finite, but as God decides to create a finite world, God steps into that space of creation, creating a physical world, creating a limited world. As God steps into that space, God assumes, not becomes, God assumes a form of limitation or God, I have to be careful with the language here, right? Not to box God in, but God manifests 
tools of limitation in that modality, you now have a limited light that comes out, a limited ray of light, emanation of light that emerges from, from that source. So light comes from source. Light is always like the source. Light is always connected with source. If they're disconnected, you don't have the light. That's how we started the class. The way we continued the class is to say that when we talk about the source with a capital S, God, you could talk about the source on two different levels. The source of God as creator or the source of God beyond creation altogether. So, so at, yeah. Sure. It makes it manageable where it can do the job that it's to do. You're talking about the infinite or the or the or the more finite light. The light, the more finite. The more finite, exactly. So the more finite light, exactly, is a light. And it's always like the power station or the software that gets transformed. Right. So you have the infinite light, and then you have the finite light. So the infinite light is the manifestation, the expression of the infinite essence reality of God, which is beyond creation. That's like beyond the rules. The rules don't even exist in that, in that space. And then you have the, the, the finite light, which is within the context of creation. You have you know, God deciding to create, and it should look like this, the light that emerges, the, the, the energy that's, 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 that's um, manifest in that, in that space is more of the finite dimension, more the finite re, uh, um, uh, reality in which there are limitations to the light. So we have two completely different levels, if you will, of light. And Kabbalah, if you study Kabbalah, this topic will come up again and again and again. This is one of the classic ideas of Kabbalah, which is why it's important. And we've talked about it many times, countless times. But it's important once in a while to like really go back to the foundation to hopefully lay it out so that it's super clear. So we have two dimensions of light. We have Ar Hamamale and Ar Asove. Ar Hamamale, I'm giving you Kabbalistic terminology. Ar Hamamale or known as Mamali Kalaman, the light that fills the space of the world is the light that's limited to the particularities, to the, to the limitations of the world. And then you have the light that's Sovev Kalaman that encompasses or transcends the worlds. And that's the, the infinite light that's beyond the confines of the world. Again, what does it mean that we have infinite light and finite light or limited light and unlimited light? Light is an expression of the source. So if there's two different dimensions of light, what that really means is that God exists in two modalities, as creator and as God, right? There's God as putting on the creator hat, let me create this world. And then there's God as God. Now, if we think of God only as creator, well, then we've limited God to only the wearing the creator hat. So imagine God takes off the creator hat. What, what did God do before he created? That's really, that's really one way to think about it. What did God do before creation? We haven't been around forever. So what happened before? What was God doing? I don't have any question. But I do know this. Wasn't creating this world, right? So what does God look like? God looks like an, looks like a pure essence beyond the limitations of creation of creating this world. God is. God is life. God is existence. God is reality. God is. It's the safest thing you could say about God is God is without getting anything anything without it, describing it any further. So God is, simply is. God is isness. And from that space, infinite light. At the same time, there's God as creator. One way to understand this, and this is an example or an analogy that the Kabbalists bring, is the analogy of a king who rules a country. And the king rules the country in two different ways by giving commands laws or edicts and by just being the king what's the difference one is the king is giving a specific rule to govern specific behavior right the king says every, from now on everyone is to wear blue on mondays done and if you're caught not wearing blue on mondays oh, oh it's not going to be good Everyone's like, oh, the king said we're blue. We have to wear blue. So that's how, like, the rules govern the people. 
king issues a rule, an edict, a decree, a law, and everyone, everyone hopefully follows, follows suit. But then you have the way the king kind of rules or governs, not based on an, a specific edict, just based on the king himself. What I mean by that is, there's a certain awesomeness about the king that transcends a particular law or edict. There's a certain larger than life quality about the king. And it's hard because we don't have a king, right? So it's like, but the mystics that lived in, in, in lands that had a king, th this was an analogy that was very much understood by anyone who, who read it or who encountered this example. So for us, it's a little bit of a, of a stretch or a little bit of a disconnect, but nonetheless, I'm going to present it because that's the way it discusses it in Kabbalah. A king is larger than, than the specific edict. The king's reputation is, is, is huge. It's big. It's not just the specific laws. It's not just the limitation of, you know, this law, that rule, this ordinance, this decree. It's beyond that. So in a similar way, not exactly, obviously, but in a similar way, there's God as rule creator, as right rule creator. And then there's God beyond that. And the beyond that is much bigger than the particulars. God as, you know, the, the, the limited reality, God in the modality of creating this limited reality is, is a much more limited form of expression than God's infinite essence. Thus, each one has, an, has a modality of expression. One we call the finite light. One is the infinite light. One is our Hamamali, the light that fills the world. And one is our Asove, the light that surrounds or encompasses reality. So in short, to summarize, what we have here are two different forms of light and revelation. There's a limited revelation of God, a limited revelation of divine power, a limited revelation of divine light, which creates and sustains the framework of this world, the limitational framework, the limitations and framework of this world. And then you have the infinite expression of light, which expresses God beyond the limitation. So what's the difference in the effect of these two lights, these two forms of light? Well, it's night and day. The limited, the Arham Amali, the finite light of God, so to speak, creates the limitations that we have. That's like the coding of the limitations that we, that we live within. Whereas the infinite light does something else. The infinite light creates a sense of that which is larger than this reality. It creates a sense that there's something beyond the here and now. So if you and I wake up one day or in the middle of the day, it comes to us the sense that, you know, there's something bigger than us, something larger than, than this reality, something outside of this limited framework. That's, that's because there is another form of light that is shining even as we are the products of limitation. There's another light that's shining that's beyond limitation. This is the infinite light. All right, let me check in. Questions, comments? Makes so, sense? Yeah. Uh, yes, Yaakov. Um, Yaakov. So assuming that um, almost all of our interaction and sustenance comes from the limited aspect of God, um, what what does come from the the Ein Sof, the Or Ein Sof, and, and how can we interact with that? Excellent question. Excellent question. When, how do we interact? When and how do we interact with the infinite light, with the orient self? What does it look like? What does the experience feel like? What's the benefit? You know, what is, like, what, what's that all about? So one way, there's different ways to answer the question. We could answer it like theoretically or super practically. I, I feel like answering it in a practical way. Um, even though today's class, we've been more focused on the concepts and not the practice. But I feel like if you're asking the question already, let's get a little practical in, in, in exploring it. So one difference would be in the way that we approach life itself. So uh, the way of approaching life through the lens of the limited light, right, the Aramamale, means that our avoda, our divine service, is likewise limited. And it's orderly and it's... Um, 
it's it's this it, it's it's measured in deliberate steps. So today I'm going to do this. Tomorrow I'll do that. I'm going to grow in measured steps. I'm going to you know within the box of this reality, you know we take measured steps and and things have to make sense for us to continue to move forward. So if I understand this mitzvah again, I'm getting super practical now because. That's one way of answering the question. So if this makes sense, so then I'm going to do it. If it doesn't make sense, I'm not going to do it. But then you and I know we have the, the, uh, the human being has the capacity to say, I'm going to just go outside of my comfort zone, right? I'm just going to go completely outside everything that I'm comfortable with, everything that I know that I'm familiar with. The status quo in this moment doesn't exist. I'm blowing it all up in a good way, right? In a positive way. And I'm going to take a step outside of what is normal. This doesn't make sense. I'm about to do something that doesn't make sense. So for example, this is brought in Kabbalah in, in countless places. The idea that a person would give up their life or be willing to give up their life for their faith. And this is something, it's not unique, but, but it's something that has been a, a, a reality within, within Judaism, within the Jewish community for centuries and millennia, where Jews, countless times, have been faced with the threat of death, right? Have been told that if you remain, um, if you remain consistent with your faith, then you will not live. You have to give up your faith, renounce your faith in order to, uh, to live and, and, and to survive. And countless Jews made the choice, I'm gonna give up my life and not, uh, and, and, and not betray my faith. So where does that come from? It doesn't make any sense. Why not just say, sure, yeah, whatever you want me to say. You want me to bow down to this thing? You want me to say that thing? You want me to sign something? No problem. At least I'll live. So what draw, What motivates a person to say, that's it, I'm out? Something larger than the box. Because if it's only in the box, then I do everything to fight to keep that box sustained. Does that make sense? Like if life is only about this existence, this limited existence, then, it, then I, I will only do everything in my power to continue to sustain this box. The idea or the ability that you and I have, and that has been historically exercised by countless Jews throughout countless difficult times, to be willing to give up their life for their faith is an act that calls upon this infinite life. So I, I don't know if that's exactly what you were, what you were thinking about, but that's one exp a practical expression of this. And the truth is anytime, that we, anytime we go outside of our comfort zone, anytime we stretch ourselves beyond the box, you know, because our, our growth pattern would be, you know, step one, step two, step three. The moment we jump to step, you know, from step three to step whatever, step X outside of our comfort zone, outside of the box, is the moment that we're drawing on a deeper power within us that is coming from a deeper power in the universe. Because if the only light that hit our reality was that finite light, no one could ever break outside that box. There wouldn't be a concept of breaking the status quo. It couldn't exist. In other words, if you're playing a game that gives you a lot of choices, you're playing a video game that gives you a lot of choices, your character can do a lot of things. You can't do something that hasn't been coded into reality. Does that make sense? You can't choose an option that hasn't already been thought about, right? And allowed for in the, in the actual programming of the game. You can't, you can't, because you're stuck inside of it. But you and I, God coded us in a way that we have access to the source code, right? That's beyond the limitations of this particular game. It's kind of like using the gaming analogy. If the game creator creates the game with the limitations and then creates an open-ended world. I'm thinking like Minecraft. My kids play a little Minecraft, a little here and there. So you can create whatever, but you're still stuck within a certain framework. I don't know if that you can still go outside, completely outside the Minecraft box because you're still stuck inside that reality. But imagine you can get like totally outside that reality. That couldn't come from within the reality. That ability would have to come outside the box. That's where the infinite light comes in. How do we tap into that? So, the, so two things. Number one, that light is, is here. 
It's not when we say it encompasses the worlds or transcends, it doesn't mean that it exists elsewhere. It exists here. That pure manifestation of Aryan Sof exists in the here and now. Typically, we access that which is part of the box. How do we access the other part? We call upon that deeper part of self. When does that happen? Typically when the box collapses around us. Typically when the box itself collapses is when that beyond the box opens up. To use Leonard Cohen, there's a crack in everything. That's how the light gets in. Right? There's a crack in everything. That's how the light gets in. As long as there's no crack, it's hard to get outside the box. And there's a crack, which is, again, the way I'm phrasing it now, when the box starts collapsing, when the box is no longer viable, when the limitation no longer works, that's typically when we access something beyond. But we have that, we have that ability. So on a practical level, it means in our day-to-day -day life, it doesn't mean that we're you know, looking to be a martyr. What it means is stretching beyond our comfort zones, getting outside the box, you know, davening longer than we usually do. So if we daven for a half an hour, it's davening for an hour. Yeah, but that's crazy. I have all these things I need to do. Welcome to the Aryan Sof, right? Make that, your, uh, make that our reality, right? Or any mitzvah. If I go beyond the natural measure, like the Talmud says, if you study 100 times, it's normal. If you review your studies, back in the day, they used to review their studies 100 times because they didn't write anything down. It was all committed to memory. So they review everything 100 times. If you studied it 101 times, it was like beyond. But it's only one more time. But it broke the comfort zone. It's outside the norm. It's outside the box. So this, this idea of the of the ain't self is when we stretch ourselves outside, which we have the ability to. If we get inspiration, is that uh, inside or outside the box? That's like, right. It depends on good. Good. It depends on which type of inspiration. It's it's it may be hard to identify, you know, where that light is coming from. Yeah. Do we think, do we know if it's within the box light or outside the box light, both lights are there. Both lights are influencing us. I don't know if we're going to be, you know, um, always, you know, 100% certain where that, where that light is coming from. But in general, the things that are part of the limitations, part of the fabric of the universe are from the finite light. The things that are a bit miraculous beyond the box, that's typically... Um, from that, from that place of supernatural. But in truth, the reason why we're looking at all of this is to explore the, the interesting dynamic. And I'm going to pull up the text in a moment. We're going to study it inside. Four interesting um, features of this finite light, of the Arhamamali, of the in-the-box light. And then we'll see how these four features don't exist in the out-of-the-box light. So maybe, the reason why I'm saying this is a segue, is that maybe this will help also help us identify which light is which. If it has these four features, then it's then it just might be the the, the finite light. If it doesn't, then it's going to be the um, more of the infinite variety. Okay, here pass this down also, please to add. Adam's already got a copy. You guys have chapter. Um, you guys have discourse nine, right? Okay, amazing. I'm going to pull it up here on the screen. We're going to get into the text. Um, give me a quick second, overcoming folly, boom. Okay, here we go. We're on page 150. So if you have the booklet, please turn to page 150. This is chapter number three. And let's pull it up. Chapter three. So he says like this. Four reasons for reckoning. What that means is what within the finite light, there's what we call a cheshben, a calculation, an accounting. Things are very deliberate in the finite light. You, if you're coding, a, I know I keep on going back to this example. When you're coding a game, you're going to be very deliberate in what it looks like. You're very calculated. You know what it's supposed to be and what it's not supposed to be. And you're creating something very specific, a specific framework for four reasons. So let's jump inside. 
He says, now the judgment and reckoning, which in Hebrew is, I believe, din v'cheshben. Let's check out the original. Yeah, din v'cheshben. The judgment and reckoning is only on account of seder hishtal shalut. Seder hishtal shalut means the framework. Seder hishtal shalut is the framework of existence. So since there's a framework of existence, a limited framework, a limited scope of reality, so the light that's emanated also needs to be very specific, very limited, very measured. That's the judgment and the reckoning. The characteristic of hishtal shalut, in other words, what defines in-the-box creation, is that precise judgment and reckoning are imperative. Right? In the box means that everything is measured. Why? For four reasons. First, take a look at this. First, it is an inner light, an arpanimi. Second, due to the concept of order. Third, it is light that is harbored within a vessel. And fourth, it's due to the hishtal shalut. It's due to the evolutionary prog progression to the next lower stage. Let us explain each of the four. That brackets is important over here because as we continue in chapter three, he's going to explain all four features of in-the-box creation. Here we go. Number one is the notion of inner light. What is inner light? So just to con con connect the phrase inner light with what we've been speaking about thus far, light is always similar to the source. Some light is coming from the place in source that is measured and deliberate and intending to go inside a box. And other light is coming from the source that actually doesn't have a recipient in mind, right? God beyond creation is not giving to a recipient. It's just God and God's emanation. That's infinite revelation of light, infinite light. The ain't self or the are ain't self. This inner light is light that is tailored and limited for a recipient, as we'll see now. Inner light. Every light. Second paragraph. Every light, whatever it is, whether intellect or emotion, has its essential nature. He's giving us a general rule when it comes to light. Light has a teva. Light has a nature. Light has a definition almost. For example, he gives, he gives two examples. The light of intellect, which we would call maybe the power of intelligence, but here in Kabbalah, we call it the light of intellect, is characteristically placid and settled. So intelligence is marked typically by a coldness, an academic or an academic, how we pronounce it, approach. Very calculated very reasoned he calls it placid and settled in the hebrew this is called his it's settled it's at rest it's not volatile typically in intellect is not volatile when you're trying to think about something to really understand something it helps to be in a settled state The light of emotion, let's continue inside. The light of emotion, by contrast, is naturally deep feeling and excitable. If you had to kind of plot, you know, like um, those machines that the heart, uh, yeah, what's that machine called? Heart monitor. It's a technical term, the heart monitor. <laughs> oh, EKG? EKG. EKG. Okay, got it. Got it. Perfect. Yeah. So, if you were to plot that, I'm also not thinking of a lie detector. Does that also work like that? With like lines and a um, earthquakes, right? So if you were to plot that for the cerebral experience, it would kind of be like a flat line. Not that it's dead, but it would kind of be like a flat line. Like in, in the intellectual experience is very, it's very settled. It's very, you know, very calm. Very... But emotions... Oh, you kidding me? Emotions up and down and up and down and here. Emotions are volatile. So intelligence, intellect is meant to be calm. It's typically calm. But emotions, 
are excitable. So what's the point of this? Every light has its nature. Every light has the way it acts. So he, so the final sentence of the second paragraph says, likewise, inner light, which is our panimi, inner light, has its essential nature. In And what is its essential nature? That it is precise and deliberate. I don't like that phrase, in its preciseness and deliberateness. I feel like the translation is a little bit confusing here. Right? Intellect is marked by calm. Emotion is marked by volatility. And inner light is marked by precision and deliberateness. That's what inner light is. Inner light is precise and deliberate. Go back to, to, to the story that we said before. If you're coding, the example, if you're coding, you have to have the right code. It has to have the right, it has to be coded correctly. It has to be precise and deliberate. It can't say the wrong thing because then you're going to have the wrong software. It's just not going to work. Okay, so inner light is precise and deliberate. The second point is order. When you're creating something that needs to be orderly, that needs to be structured, you also need to have a reckoning. Here we go. Order is characterized by reckoning and preciseness, both quantitatively and qualitatively. So, for example, let's think of an example here. If you are writing a book, right, and you want the book to make sense, you're trying to tell a story, you're trying to create a piece of art, right? It, it, there has to be some sort of order to the presentation. So you have to think, how am I going to order it? How am I going to set this out in a way that makes sense? It has to be thought about. It has to be done precise. And he says both quantitatively and qualitatively. It has to be the right amount and it has to be the right stuff in order for the order to work. Next, feature number three, lights in vessels. When you have light in vessel, you also need a cheshben. You also need some sort of reckoning to figure out if it's going to work. So look what he says. Third, um, one, two, three, four. Fourth paragraph. Lights harbored in vessels must be delicately tailored to the vessels. Although in general, vessel and light are, con are consonant with one another, as are the physical. He gives an example. As, for example, with the physical brain and the power of intellect and the physical, I'm adding words here to explain, and the physical heart with the power of emotion. So let me just stop here. It's a long sentence. Let me just pause here for a, sec for a second and give you the analogy. He says, when, it when you're dealing with light that is manifest in a vessel, the light needs to be tailored to the vessel. So we think in our, our brains are what gives us the power to think. Now, the brain itself is not the power of intelligence because you could have a brain in a jar that doesn't think, right? Because the brain is not, it's not, there's the sole power of intelligence is not flowing through it. It's not, so the light is not, the vessel might be there, but the light is not there. The light of the soul of the power of intellect, the chachma, bina, and the das that goes into the brain is the light and the brain is the vessel and they work together. The point is that we think in our heads, we don't think in our toes because the toe is not the vessel for the light of intelligence, the brain is. So the physical brain is a conduit for the power of intelligence of the soul. The same thing is true with the emotion and the heart. The heart is the physical conduit for the emotions of the soul. So although he's saying this is true in general, that the physical vessel is tailored fit, is tailored to fit the spiritual power, the light and vessel are exi exist in harmony. Nevertheless, he says, fourth line down in lights and vessels in that paragraph, nevertheless, there must be a measurement to the luminary of the intellect regarding its manner of dwelling in the brain and likewise with emotions. So he says, although there's a general um, compatibility between intellect and brain and emotions and heart, there has to be a specific reckoning a specific and deliberate process by which the intellect tailors itself to the capacity of the mind and the emotions tailor themselves to the capacity of the heart what happens if you get something a light that's too big for the vessel right 
The vessel can't contain the lid. We talked about this numerous times. And it damages the vessel. The light is not contained. He's going to speak about this in a moment, by the way, on a physical level. Without this measurement, without, so there's the general compatibility. Yeah, we think in our brains. We feel in our hearts. That's the general compatibility. But then there has to be a specific reckoning and accounting that the soul does to make sure that the intellect and the brain can be contained by the brain or that the feeling in the heart can be contained by the heart. Otherwise, it's not going to be healthy for the system. Without this measurement, the second measurement, not the original compatibility, but this, the precise measurement without that, the physical, look at what he says, the physical vessel of, of brain and heart will be incapable of containing the overwhelming light of intellect and emotion and the vessels will be harmed. If the soul allows for the brain to be overloaded by intelligence, the brain is going to get harmed, God forbid. If the soul allows for its light of emotion to overwhelm the heart, the heart, the vessel will be, God forbid, can be, God forbid, harmed. Look what he says here. There are, God forbid, so many who suffer incapacities mental and emotional disorders caused by overabundance, apologies for this, caused by overabundance of light. Give me a second here. There are, God forbid, it's a WhatsApp call that's taking over. The light is too big for the vessel. It's making all this noise. There are, God forbid, so many who suffer incapacities, mental and emotional disorders caused by overabundance of light and a paucity, a, a, a um, limitation of vessels, absorb, absorptive capacity. In other words, what does it look like when somebody has too many ideas in their head that they can't process, right? It can, har it, it, it can be physically harmful. What happens if someone feels too much more than they can contain, it can likewise be harmful. That's what he's saying here, right? When our, when, our, when our head is not in a good place or our heart is not in a good place, what's happening in that moment, again, understood through a Kabbalistic lens, is the light, there's too much light for the vessel. Typically, we think, oh, the more light, the better, right? The more, the merrier. Who doesn't want more light? Yeah, if this light is good, more light is even better. Give me more. Supersize me, right? Give me more light. I'll take more. Double it up. Triple it up. But when it comes to light that needs to be harbored and contained in a vessel in order for it to be a healthy situation, you don't want too much light. I've said this example so many times, but I'll say it again. You know, you know how many different things are happening around us at any given moment? Like different sights and sounds and smells. and So many different things are happening around us. If you and I were 100% attuned to every stimuli, stimulus, whatever, that's around us at any given moment, it would be completely overwhelming. We would shut down. Why? Too much light, not enough vessel. Be overwhelming. If you and I felt all the feelings all the time for everything that, that, that is felt in the world, we couldn't, we, we, we couldn't bear the weight of that feeling. There are people who feel all the feelings. There are people who, who have, who are filled with all the thoughts. And it's challenging. That's his point. It's challenging. Too much light. Too much light for the vessel. You know, when somebody feels too much, the natural reaction is to desensitize the feelings. I can't, I can't feel this. I'm feeling too much. Which can lead to actions, almost the need to, to dull feeling. Because I can't live with such sensitivity. Most people, the, most people survive because they turn their heart off and their brain off. To some extent, not, not totally, but to some extent. 
again, going back to feeling, if you and I felt all of the empathy for all of the suffering in the world, how could we go, how could we go on? Couldn't exist like that. It would be impossible. It would be crushing to feel all the feelings. It'd be impossible. So what's the solution? We don't feel all the feelings. We block all the feelings. But what happens if you can't block all the feelings? Because there's too much light, and it is what it is. The person is wired in such a way where their soul has an extreme, powerful light flowing in, intellectually, emotionally, both or either or whatever or otherwise. It can, it can create a challenge within the physical human being because the vessel can't contain it. And this is what he's talking about here. Challenges in mind and heart, psychological or emotional challenges that are born of an overabundance of light, which again, light is typically a good thing. But when it's too much light, it can become overwhelming. How do we ensure that the light, again, there's not, 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 not suggesting a simple fix, but in general, how does, how is, what is the solution in general, not in a specific case, but in general, it's lessening the light. How do you lessen the light with, with regards to the human beings? And, and this is, is beyond the scope of this conversation. But lessening the light requires a deliberate accounting of how much, what is the capacity of the vessel, how much light can, can safely flow into that vessel, and proceed accordingly. So the point here is, this is another reason why there has to be a calculation, a very deliberate reckoning. Number four, let's do the fourth element here at the bottom of page 150. So light. I see service. So, all right. Light. I'm just going to cut out the word. So light, whose purpose is to descend, whose purpose it is to descend to the next lower stage must be measured precisely according to the dimensions of the recipient vessel. For, for, for were it not in the correct dimension, not only will it not be able to receive the light, the light may well destroy the vessel. And this is not just referring to light and vessel, but light going down to the next vessel beneath its original vessel. In other words, speak, using the term evolution, or in this case, maybe devolution. So when, it, when the light needs to go downward from one generation, so to speak, to another generation, or from one iteration to another iteration, it has to be tailored constantly. It has to be able to be tailored mindfully to each successive step. For if it were, oh, I just read that, if it were not in the recurrent dimension, it would blow up the vessel. By illustration, he says, when a teacher, this is an example that I gave last week, when a teacher conveys a concept to his pupil and he gives beyond the capacities of the student, so besides the student not learning the concept, his mental instruments will be completely confused. So not only will the student not understand, but there will be confusion. The reason is that any light that progresses to a lower stage must be proportionate to that stage. So if the light is going down, not just in, but downward, it has to be cut even further, limited even further to fit that lower stage. The parallel can be understood in terms of the supernal sefirot that descend progressively. So going back to our sefirot chart, our mystical chart of divine energies, it's not just that there are 10 energies, but there's actually a flow by which each energy goes successively down. The light starts with Chachma, goes to Bina, goes to that. That's why we have lines connecting them, although they are kind of separate realities, separate worlds, but there's another way to understand it in which the light flows downward between all the different energies. And so what's the point here? The point is for a number of reasons, there has to be a very deliberate and precise reckoning when it comes to inner light. Number one, because it's inner light. And inner light means that, it, it, by definition, inner light means that it's calculated. Number two, there's an order to all of this. In order to have order, there has to be precision. There has to be a reckoning. Um, lights in vessels. For light to go into vessel, it has to be tailored to the vessel. For light to go down, to descend into a lower vessel, it certainly needs to be deliberately and precisely cut to fit that lower vessel. So for, for these four reasons, and I'm sure many others, when it comes to the light, the inner light within the box of creation known as Seder Hishashot, that kind of structure and framework of existence that we're in, within the game, within the box, everything is deliberate and everything is calculated. And if it doesn't make sense, it's not going to go further. 
everything has to make sense to proceed to the next checkpoint. The contrast is when it comes to the infinite light. We'll speak about that next week. When it comes to the infinite light, which is beyond the box, no rules, no order, no reckoning, no accounting, no receipts. It's available. <laughs> no receipts. Just take. It's the light is available. So when the light goes in the box, it plays by the rules of the box. When the light is outside the box, it plays by those rules, i.e. the unrules of the light outside the box. And all of this, as you know by now, because we've all been studying this for a little while now, all of this, as you know, is explaining a higher level understanding of how it could be that the wicked can prosper. How is it that evil can be successful? Where does it get its energy from? One way is by accessing this out of the box, infinite light energy in which there's no accounting, no reckoning, no receipts. I don't know why I like that one, that phrase, no receipts. No receipts, no measurements, doesn't have to go inside a box, no calculation, it's open and available if you can get to that space transcend to that space. So this is something we'll continue next week. So what's the message for this week? The message is that typically we live in the box and we need to be as we say in Yiddish. We need to be thought out. We need to be meticulous. If we want to create a business, we have to go about it in, a, in an orderly fashion. We have to go about it in a successful fashion. You want to um, Build a car, you have to know what you're doing. I don't know why I used build a car as an example. I'm not planning on building a car, but nonetheless, if I were planning on building a car, I would have to figure out how it's done. You have to put the right size engine for the right size vehicle. That's a good example of light investment, right? If you put a massive engine inside a soapbox car, the wheels are going to come flying off. It's not going to be good. Anyway. All right, some, some ideas to think about this week as we reflect on Kabbalah and Kafi, the power of order. Order is not a bad thing. It might be of a lower state than the higher thing, but it's not bad, it's good. It's the fabric of our universe. We're meant to live typically in the space of order. And we're also made designed not to be limited to that order, but, but we're supposed to, to live within that order. So what that means is on a practical level, in this month of El, we're supposed to take these days Today is the seventh day of El, which means we have another 23 days. We're meant to take these days and prepare for the high holidays. And that means, you know, think about things that we can improve in our life, things that we can tweak, things that we should cut out from our behaviors, things that we should add to our behaviors. And that's a methodical process, step by step. Finite light, make it work, make it compatible with our reality all right that's it for today um let's turn first to our online crew thank you very much for joining susan luann yakov linda joy tony alex joy fran good to see you fran and richard great to see you um any questions or comments jump in Yes. You know, I always have a question or comment that's good, <laughs> but, it's a good um my question is is that what the the energy that you're talking about and you talked about it last week and the energy that you're talking about now is that just simply the uh the energy that is from the creative force that is given to us as a gift uh to to live and to survive so sort of the the animal energy that um is here as just the energy that we're given or am i missing no, no, you could you could refer to it as kind of like a pragmatic animal existential, you know, physical, you know, um, energy. But I think there's also it could also be the spiritual energy. There could, there, in other words, there could be a spiritual energy that's also in the box. Like the example that I gave before is a methodical approach to a divine connection, a methodical approach, a measured approach to spirituality. So it's spiritual by nature, but it's methodical, it's step by step, as opposed to an out of the box idea. You know, the book is called Overcoming Folly, because typically folly is not a good thing. But there is a discourse, the actual, the last discourse that the previous Rebbe 
wrote and published before his passing in 1950, this is going back a number of years, was all about converting negative folly, right? The one that we're trying to overcome into holy folly, right? To convert, to, instead of doing things that make no sense in a bad way, do things that make no sense in a good way. Like volunteer when it doesn't make sense, when you don't have the time. Like, I don't have the time. I'm still going to do, I'm still going to volunteer. That doesn't make any sense. Holy folly, Batman, right? That's like holy, holy form of, of, of out of the box. So within the box, the box doesn't only mean, my point is the box doesn't necessarily mean animal or, you know, kind of ego and, and, and lower in, in a, in an unholy way. It could even be holy limitation. Really, this is the flow of energy on all the levels, animal, godly, that is, that is still limited. And again, the way it manifests in our, in our behavior is when we tell ourselves that, that our spiritual growth is taking, you know, is, is, go, is being plotted along these lines, that's, that's being limited. Not a bad thing, but it's still walking a specific path as opposed to jumping and leaping, which would be accessing and harnessing a, a, an energy beyond the deliberate energy. I've used the example before as I look around the art. You know, art used to be, my understanding at least, I'm not an expert on the origins and philosophy of art, but if I were, this is what I would say, that art used to be very realistic. People would paint, they would paint like portraits. It's like, oh, what am I painting? The way you look, or the way that landscape looks, or the way the tree looks. I'm going to paint what I see. And then at a certain point, people started, started summoning from a more abstract place within. It's like, I'm not only going to create art that I see, I'm going to create something that I don't see or something beyond the literal. And so it's not a perfect analogy, right? I'm not saying it's exactly this, but it also reflects this duality. The in the box or out of the box, right? within the confines of the structure or outside the confines of structure. So yeah, you know what? Maybe I wouldn't spend, I don't remember, $150,000 on a banana taped to a wall. <laughs> Nor would I recommend it necessarily, unless it's your thing. And then who am I to say no? But there's a, the reason why it has an allure to people, I think, is because it's so outside the box. Because it's so dare I say, Meshuga, so crazy. It's outside the box. And there is a part of us that recognizes and that needs a little outside the box sometimes. It's like the inside the box is good as long as it's good, but we still need a little outside the box because that's part of our reality. And to not access it is to really not get in touch with something that is part of the reality. What I'm trying to say is that part of our reality is an energy that's beyond our reality. But not tapping into that does ourselves a disservice. Anyway, the point is though, to answer your question or to, to bring it back around to your question, that there's in the box spiritual thinking as well. It's not just animalistic thinking, there's the spiritual thinking that's inside the box that is inherently limited. It's not a bad thing, but it's a limited thing. It is what it is. Rabbi, if we um, get out of our let's say self-defeating thoughts or just <clears throat> the, you know, the, the monkey mind, um, the, uh, and, and, and go on faith, you know? So like, like you were saying, just, uh, do something right beyond, uh, beyond our normal self-limited thinking, you know, would that be connection to the aim so part of our, yes. Soul? yes. And then also, you know, people say, well, you know, I, I'm religious, I'm not religious, but I have a, my own connection to God. So, you know, all that type of thing where we have communication with God or communication with, with our deceased, you know, people, you know, relatives or whoever, um, you know, would that be in so or is that all part of this, this box? I don't know if I could speak on, on a specific level and to define any specific scenarios, but to speak in, in generality and to focus on kind of the first thing that you mentioned, because I, 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 and there's something that specific that I can say about that. The rebel would tell people often, 
And the Rebbe was not only a tzaddik, but also a mystic and someone who was able to see the spiritual, the spiritual dimensions. The Rebbe told people that, that, that were looking for a miracle in their lives, that needed a miracle, you know, for what, health or, what, or otherwise, that one way to open up that channel is by doing something that goes outside of your norm. In other words, if, the, if you want to tap into a outside-the-box possibility, then create that possibility in your life first. Because if you're limited, when I say you're, if me and you, if we are limited to the box, well, then that's all we're accessing. But when we, act, when we touch upon within ourselves first, we start within ourselves, when we, when, we, when we access something that goes outside of our limitations, outside our box, so to speak, outside the status quo, then we are also opening up a channel to this larger connection from, from where miracles can flow. And the supernatural is as possible as the natural. So really, as we are, so does the universe flow for us. Um, it's all related. It's all, inter as we discussed you know, in these sessions as well, everything is interrelated. And, and it starts with us. Like this month, Elo, Ani Lododi Vidodi Li. The energy that we put out to God, to the universe, is the energy that comes back to us. I'm to my beloved, the way I show up for them, for the other, is the way they show up for me. So when I show up in my life, breaking boundaries, then God shows up for me also breaking those boundaries. May it be in our lives indeed that we should really get out of our limitations to the best of our ability, of course, and, uh, and experience the blessings that we need and even beyond. All right, we'll officially close out. We're running a little bit late, but thank you very much for joining this morning for Cabal and Coffee. It's great to see you all. Have a wonderful day. Have a wonderful week. And we'll see you guys soon. Take care, everybody. Bye.